My name is Martin Matter with the Witness to War Foundation. It's November 3rd, 2019, and we are in Seattle, Washington for the United States Marine Corps Tankers, uh, Vietnam Tankers Association reunion. Uh, sir, if you could say your name and spell it for me. Jim Rash, spelled R-A-A-S-C-H, pronounced Rash. And what years were you in the Marine Corps, and more specifically, what years were you in Vietnam? I was in the Marine Corps in 1968. 1969, I was in Vietnam 1969. And serving with what unit? Alpha Company, 5th Tanks, 3rd Battalion, 26 Marines. We were a battalion landing team and we did make some uh, non-fighting landings <laughs> off of an LSD. As I told my college friends when I went back to college when I was in Vietnam, I was on LSD. <laughs> so tell me about an event in Vietnam that stands on your mind. Well, these aren't aren't battle hard ones, but uh, when I first got there, uh, a lot of members of my platoon were off doing this and that extension uh, liber or, uh, time off, and so I was on a different tank every time, but one of the first nights I was on guard duty at a place called Anwa along the uh, airstrip, and I was standing on the loader seat and, and had the binoculars, and I looked, and I looked, and I said to tank man, I said, Louie, there's gooks in the wire. Oh, there ain't damn gooks I said, no, there's gooks on well, Give me those damn binoculars. And he looked and said, there's gooks, gooks in the wire. And we had to have permission to fire because the ville was right on the other side, and they wouldn't give us permission to fire. And he said, well, if they come through the wire, we're going to open up with small arms. Well, I didn't know shit, so I'm loading an M16, <laughs> not knowing he meant the 30 caliber on the tank. Loader, get your ass back in <laughs> So that was kind of my first indoctrination into being a tanker. But my journey to being a tanker was a little different than a lot of people. Uh, I was a junior in college and I dropped human physiology and lost my deferment. So to dodge a draft, I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> it, as luck would have it, it was a two year enlistment, luck would have it. Uh, about the time I'd have been drafted, the Marines were doing massive drafting because nobody joined after Tet of 68. And uh, I went to boot camp, and because of my education, I had to be the secretary for the DIs and was in the duty out with them a lot, getting pounded on. And uh, went through my drill instructor having a nervous breakdown. And there's a story in that. I don't know if it's worth telling. Yeah, but please. Um, we were on me me mess duty during mess and maintenance week uh, during boot camp, and I was in the uh, duty hut with the DIs all day while everybody's mess duty and the uh, uh, drill instructor or the platoon commander had uh, been there and he had a very large book and he snuck, he left one day and I snuck over to look at it and it was a study guide to the Bible and I'm a pretty religious man and he was spouting some things that didn't quite seem right and then the next time he came in because they were they were on 24, off 48 during that week, so it was kind of their vacation time. And he came in and he was just spouting this weird shit, and I thought, something wrong with this guy. And uh, I thought, should I tell somebody? So the next day I came in and I jumped up, private rash request me to speak to the drill instructor. And he always said, utter, so to speak. I said, Sir, the private has observed the platoon commander having some very serious mental problems. And he popped me, just cold cocked me. Don't you tell anybody. He was gone. He never came back, that platoon commander. So apparently they knew he was having trouble. So, so yeah, so we're through boot camp. Go through all the training. Uh, we all flew to Okinawa. First tanks, third tanks, and fifth tanks. Well, I didn't know there was. Fifth Division had not been in existence since World War II, but they did have a platoon in Okinawa, Alpha Company 5th Tanks, h &S platoon. And uh, so we were uh, at the top end of the island. There were about 45 of us. We had no tank. They called us Alpha 5-0 because we had O tanks. And I was company armor. And uh, so we kept busy, a lot of stuff. First thing we did, we did rubber boat landings off a of submarine, tankers, got sunburned. And it was one of my funny stories. I, I was had to take an inventory report every day up to uh, regimental headquarters, and I couldn't wear shoes, socks, trousers. So I wore my little red boot camp shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops. 
and I went flip-flopping up the street into regimental headquarters. The major came down the hallway, damn near blew his head off. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I don't give a shit about it. And I pulled out my little corpsman. I don't care what you got. You don't leave the area without a, wearing the UD. So I had to have people bring me food for two weeks. That was my first duty station. Uh, we did all kinds of weird stuff there. We went to jump training for two weeks till the lieutenants found out about it because our Mustanger captain thought it'd be cool to have a platoon of tankers with jump wings. We did training in northern training area with the Green Berets. We were their indigenous personnel. And I later found out that the officer in charge of northern training area was Ollie North, of all things. And uh, I went to school. I went to Jeep driving school, pickup PC or pickup driving school, six by truck driving school, infantry weapons repair school. I ran out of schools, got tired of all the spit and shine, so I volunteered to go to Vietnam. So you see a thing here, I used to keep volunteering. And that's when I first did a place called Anwa, and we were uh, attached to Alpha Company, or to uh, Bravo Company, first tanks, because our infantry were out doing their thing somewhere else. And it was kind of funny, just before I got there, when they got transferred, uh, and it was Lieutenant Colonel Zitz, then Captain Zitz was in charge, our Jeep driver put they always had a little sign in front of the lieutenant's jeep, and he put on it, Alpha Company, 5th Tanks, in support of Bongo Company, 1st Tanks. And Captain Zitz saw that and dressed down our lieutenant pretty good over that thing, so it was kind of funny. And uh, I guess in the next thing, that, without going into battle things, which I don't care to do, but uh, we used to get rocket attacks in the after every afternoon. It didn't amount to much, but you know they tore up the area. But the siren would go, and if, if we weren't on our tanks, we had to get them out of the tank park. And So we ran out, jumped on tank, I put my comm helmet on, stand on the loader seat, tank commander says, driver, start it up, move us out. Nothing. Driver, start it up, move us out. Nothing. He said, loader, go down and see why you can't hear me. I went down, I looked in, nobody there. And I didn't, wasn't hooked up, couldn't talk to him because I didn't, wasn't hooked up the radio. I went like that, jumped up, I said, there's nobody there. He said, can you drive this thing? Well, yeah. I said, well, start it up and get us the fuck out of here. So I did, and all clear came. We came back, and, and our driver was dabbling fairly heavily in pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and he'd gone to the officer's bunker <laughs> and was sleeping in there. And my tank commander was kind of a mean guy, three tours in Vietnam. And he carried a helicopter pilot's revolver, and this driver, Willie Guyton, woke up with the revolver in his mouth. I came that far from getting his head blown off. So that made it quite an impression on me. That was my first week or so in, in country. Um, and uh, then after that, you know, we, we did a lot of, of uh, convoys. And every morning, uh, we were at a place called Anwa, and we had to take uh, do a, a mine sweep of the road every morning as we escorted a convoy of empty trucks heading back to Da Nang. And we went to a place called Fulock 6, or Liberty Bridge, that had been burned. So they had a uh, barge that uh, they would pull the trucks, empty truck, full truck, back and forth. And one time we went out there, and there was a tank that uh, the engine transmission were out of it. And, and they wanted to tow it back to the rear to be worked on. And we towed it up there and backed it onto the barge. Okay, that's good. Well, the truck starts pulling it off, and as it came off shore, it started rocking. Well, whenever they could, villagers would jump on those barges to cross the river. It rocked in, it went in the water. Killed a whole shit pot full of them. And so there's bodies floating down the river, blood in the river. And so we got to get the tank out of there. Well, about all you could see was the cannon up above. So somebody, and I talked to an individual that was there too, and neither one of us knew who did it, but somebody had to swim down in and hook tow cables, and we hooked three tanks and two Amtraks to it to pull it out of the mud because of that suction. And they had the bodies that were left laid out there, but they, when they pulled the, the tank out, there were some people and adults and some little kids had got sucked into the tank, so pulling those bodies out. And that was, to me, that was one of the most traumatic things I saw in Vietnam, really, because all those kids. And then later that day, well, not too much later, here come officers and jeeps with village elders there, and, and then eventually towed the damn tank back to where it was at. Uh, so that was one 
one kind of memorable night. Uh, Did you have any experiences with wildlife? When we were at a place called Elephant Valley uh, on Hill 190 out from Den Da Nang, uh, some of the grunts killed a tiger. And they had a big bamboo thing, or six of them carrying this big ass tiger in. That was kind of cool. And then they had this thing they called rock apes. And I never saw it myself, but I heard all these stories that they literally would throw rocks at people. <laughs> but they would be in the mountains. And I did see them with binoculars across from our, our site there. These gorillas, I guess, rock apes. Um, we, uh, our slot there was down and it was hard to get on the tank, so we had some of the uh, steel they used for uh, runways for a gangplank. And every once in a while on guard duty at night, a damn mongoose would come over to visit us. <laughs> so, never saw a lot of rats like some guys did, some of the big rats. I saw one big one one time, I thought it was a muskrat or something so big. But never, that was about it for wildlife. Uh, we didn't have any pets. Some guys I know had monkeys, and we didn't have that. Um, so I probably, as far as wildlife, that would have been about all I ever saw. But my tour was short. I was only there seven months because I did the first part of my 13 months in Okinawa, and I didn't have to be there. I could have stayed in Okinawa being bored for seven more months. But and then um, death by boredom is death yeah. Die. Well, then uh, I learned through that summer that I would be eligible to get out right away. And, and when I came home, my orders were stamped eligible early release. And then the next bad thing, I got to Okinawa to come home, and uh, they, with one of my platoon mates, uh, Patrick Robinson, and they said, uh, you guys probably won't make the flight, you'll get bumped off of it, because majors and above, people on emergency leave, people extend their tour of duty that had 30 days free leave could bump you. And so we had to stand inspection in our dress uniforms, high and tight haircut, polished brass, but by signed shoes. But when we came back, they made us turn in all our jungle utilities and jungle boots because they're so short of clothes for the, the guys going to Vietnam. So I had a set of dress clothes and a pair of blue trousers and a, a plaid shirt and penny loafers because I couldn't wear my dress uniform because I had to stand inspection. So we went down, they didn't go on a plane. Thought, okay, we go on the next plane. Well, that isn't the way it worked. You wait for the next bunch to come to Vietnam to get remanifested, stand inspection again, and then didn't make that flight. So they made me an NCO in charge of a transit barracks. And all I was doing was going to the NCO club every night and getting drunk. But I was at the mess hall one day and uh, sitting on the outside, they had tables for four and then big tables in the middle. And I did not know what had happened till later, but there was uh, an individual got stabbed in the throat with a serving fork, and he bled out, and it was a racial thing. And all hell broke loose, fighting, chairs flying, and I'm crawling along the wall to get the hell out of it. I didn't get killed in Vietnam, I only get killed in a mess hall in Okinawa. And that night, a white guy got hung off the water tower. And I got kicked out. I couldn't go to the mess hall without wearing a uniform mask, so I had to eat at the, the NCO club all the time. And I think I was there 12 days to get out. And as luck would have it, one of my platoon mates came through who had been home on emergency leave and uh, he neglected to come back. And he'd spent the summer at Treasure Island Brig in San Francisco. <laughs> and, so, and I came home, they said, uh, got to El Toro Air, Air Base, and they said, you got two choices. Uh, your or take your leave off your orders or report to your duty station or go to Camp Pendleton for a week and get transferred out. And I'm thinking back to my college days and the co-eds and the beer or Camp Lejeune and it was a fairly easy decision. So 19 months, 19 days later, I was a free man. That's and, but, I, but I turned 21 in boot camp, 22 in Vietnam. My lieutenant was only a year older than me. In fact, his birthday was March 13th and mine was March 27th. So. We're about the same age, and you know you couldn't fraternize with officers. You weren't supposed to. But I've become very close to him since then. We talk a lot. And in fact, I went to visit him for a few days last summer. So, and I've been a member of this organization for 20 years, and been to all the reunions, and made a whole bunch of new friends. And and uh, I guess 
That's pretty much it. I don't care to talk about a lot of the other stuff. And that's totally fine. Well, yeah. uh, what do you want people to remember about Vietnam based on your experience there? I guess you had a lot of people that did their duty. And it, it was a tough time coming home. We weren't popular. I never had anybody spit on me or call me names. I was lucky as I returned to college campus, I had friends just came home. There were about eight or nine of us hung out. Nobody gave us any shit. <laughs> but, you know, it was a turbulent time. Kent State, and after Kent State, uh, most college universities kind of closed down. We didn't have final tests that spring of 70. Um, and it was, it was hard, you know, you felt you'd done something and they felt you did something bad. And like I said, I, I never had people spit on me or swear at me, but they they knew who you were when you hit a college campus with hair to hair and you had hair to hair. Uh, and, and that was hard because you thought you'd done something. And that's what makes this group great. And lastly, any words of advice, final thoughts for anybody watching this in the future? Um, I'm disappointed in our country that we don't have more middle and upper middle class volunteer for the military. We've got a country that has no stake in the country. Um, and I think people should think about volunteering for something. I volunteer for a lot of groups. Um, and I guess let's make sure our politicians don't get us in wars we shouldn't be in. And if we're in them, let us fight the war to win, which they didn't let us do which is very frustrating for all of us. You know, the, the boundaries of what we could do were stupid. Um, but, you know, as I said, 10 fingers, 10 toes. So, life is good. Thank you so much for taking the time today, okay. Jim. Uh, uh, but more importantly, thank you so much for your service. Sure, thank you.